Welcome. Um, it's lovely to have so many primary teachers involved in science on stage now. You know, I was a boring physics teacher for all my teaching life, and I taught physics, a little bit of maths, a little bit of RE here and there, and that was that was it. Whereas you folks are so, so flexible, and so I have so much admiration for you, because you have to go into your classroom and teach a bit of geography, a bit of history, a bit of science, a bit of maths, a bit of English, well, a bit of English, German, Czech, whatever it is, and so on. So I do admire you. Uh, never feel that you don't have as much uh, information or knowledge in your head as us uh, secondary teachers. Um, I just think you're so fabulous with what you're doing. So anyway, that's sort of to say how nice you are. And <clears throat> so what happens next? I've actually called for primary talking science because I think there's a big difference between um, the way secondary students will approach this, the older ones, and primary. Oh, I should have said, if I'm talking too quickly, send a message to uh, the chat and uh, Danielle will try and slow me down because that was a criticism yesterday I got quite excited about what I was doing with the secondary people and spoke a little bit too quickly. So <clears throat> here we go. So talking science, I mean, that's what it is all about with, um, with primary people. Um, I, I, I think uh, it's introducing them, children to science and ideas, getting them to observe and so on, um, and, uh, and, and see where you go from there. We've, I've done this sort of workshop in different countries, as you'll see, and I've done it with different ages, sometimes with teachers, sometimes with student teachers, and sometimes in class classes from senior students right down to primary. And I do love working with the primary children because they're, they're so enthusiastic and it gets children talking science. Um, these experiments are all published in Physics Education, um, the journal. You can download the articles freely, looking at what happens next. Um, I do warn you that the Physics Education like a little more complicated uh, explanations sometimes, and it's, it's targeted at more the higher age range. But also, um, there is a fair, I've just started with lockdown, and when lockdown started, I started a Facebook page, a group called What Happens Next Experiments. It's a private group. And that, all that means is that you've got to ask to join. Um, I think if I put it online totally, uh, all of a sudden you would be looking, I wouldn't know who was there and who wasn't. So um, when you go to What Happens Next Experiments on Facebook and ask to join, there's a few questions. They're not a test or anything. It just says, where are you? And uh, what's your interest in science? And I know that it's an actual person asking to join the group and not somebody's computer. But I started, and I started in I think, March or so, just before Easter. The first experiment was to do with Easter eggs. And every day since then, I've been putting a different experiment online. I thought I'd finish but I'm still going, and one or two people are working on some more. Um, they're very informal. Sometimes I make a mistake, but I've left that on because I think it's important to see that sometimes things go wrong. And you often learn more when things go wrong than when they go right. So I'd recommend that group. I'd love to see you on it, and we can have a chat there. If there are some questions afterwards that you don't get resolved, please, please feel free to email me. Do you know I'm retired? Do you know what retired means these days? That you sit around and do the garden and you have a chat with your grandchildren. You don't have to worry about uh, social distancing in school. You just keep away from other people. So I have plenty of time if you want to have a chat. We can even have a Zoom together and, uh, and look at some of these later. So feel free to get in touch. It's lovely to have friends all over the place. So here we go. Um, Depending on your age, how you would set this up in a classroom, you might have little groups. 
I think that tends to work best with the older children, um, the sort of 9, 10, 11s, whereas the younger ones are much more, um, ha or much happier in a little group on the, on the carpet. I've, I've been amazed how many little children you can get on a fairly small carpet around you doing these sort of 30 is, is not a big carpet. It's quite, quite fun for me and quite different when I've been teaching 17 and 18 year olds. Um, so it began this, I do this fairly quickly, speaking slowly, to engage students and involve all students in the class in discussion. Now, um, that's more of a problem in senior schools, I think, than in primary schools, because most of the children are still very enthusiastic, although you've got to watch, haven't you, that somebody's not left out. Um, so we have short demonstrations, short experiments, which lead to discussions. That's the idea. And particularly for primary children, I think it's an opportunity to observe what's going on and then describe in appropriate language. I got that from Emma Crissell in Harrogate. Thanks, Emma, if you're, if you're there. Um, but I, I think that's really important that you can, can enable the children to discuss, to say what they think, and then, then sort of comment on it. And of course, nothing is stupid. Everything is interesting. Do you know, it took me a long time to realise that when I was teaching, that if somebody gives an answer, it's come from what they think. So it is an interesting answer, even if it's totally wrong. So that's, we've said that about the language. Develop investigation skills, because when you see something, you might ask a question, then have to work out an experiment to prove it. It gives an opportunity for children to present an idea. Take home experiments, parents meetings, and you can't see that on the side, but under the coloured writing it says, and it's a bit of fun. So here we go. So this, uh, what I'm going to give you is a selection of what I think might be useful. Um, so I'm just going to sort of have a little journey through floating and sinking in this way of asking what's going to happen. So you may have just get rid of that. If you have an orange and you float an orange, it actually floats. See, that floats. But what happens when you peel it? Well, I think you can see on the next slide. I can do it in real life, because here I have one that I peeled earlier. There's the peel, there's the orange, and down it goes. It sinks. And so I had a lovely discussion with a class of five-year-olds about this. Um, some thought it was there was air inside the orange. Others said, well, this, and I thought this was really amazing. This, the peel is a buoyancy age, they said, a buoyancy age, you know, like the swimming baths. So we had quite a discussion about that, which was very fruitful. But talking of fruit, there's a lot more you could do in terms of floating fruit. I don't think we should get some mysterious block out of the cupboard to do floating and sinking. I think we should use the things that are around. So what about, um, oh, it's, it's over on the other. What about a lemon and a lime? My lime is on the other side of the, the room, so I better not move too much. But a, a lemon will float and a lime We'll sink. I'll just do it. You've got to be a little bit careful with fruit because um, if you leave it too long, it, it changes. Let's put that in. And yes, the line goes down. So why, why is that? We can have a discussion and you can look at a lemon and a lime. And if you look carefully, you can see that the lime has a very thin skin and the lemons often have thick skins. Or you might like to try, and this is interesting, an apple and a pear. We can throw them all in this pot. 
but um, a pair sinks. Oh, well, this that orange is getting in the way. Let's just take that out. Pair six. And the, the, the fascinating thing is this, in England at any rate, everybody knows that an apple will float. It's a different type. It's not because of experiments. It's because in England on 31st of October, we have what we call ducky apple, where you put an apple in a big bowl of water, put several apples in, you've got to duck your high head in. So everybody knows that apples float. So there's so many different things you can do with floating and sinking. Um, another nice, let's just move that out of the way, one that amuses a lot of children is the lava lamp, I call it, where you get some lemonade, fizzy drink, and you pop into the lemonade some sultanas and the sultanas go down. Can you see them going down? If we put it in a glass, which I have somewhere, the sultanas sink down to the bottom and then they go up again. Great for observation skills, this. What happens is the bubbles form on the sultanas at the bottom and then they rise again. Oh, here's my glass. You might be able to see it better in a glass. You can see them going. They look very close. You can see them going up. But they're down at the bottom, they form bubbles, and of course they're not working there. Put a few more in. It's May have lost a bit of its fizz. They're still going up and down in the bottle. There's one. And down it goes. And then they come up again. There it goes up again. So you can see, oh, sorry, I wasn't in the camera. You can see that. So that's the lemonade just now. You can do it in the pub with peanuts and beer, but it actually spoils the beer. So I would recommend sultanas and lemonade. Um, other things you can do with floating and sinking. Oh, this is a good one. Um, if you half the orange, um, will it sink flat side up or curved side up? And people tend to think because it looks like a boat curved side up, it'll float that way, but it actually floats upside down. Not like that, like that because the heaviest part of the orange is at the bottom. Lots of little discussions you can have around that. Um, the other one I quite like with uh, fruit, not, and not fruit, I leave the fruit in, is, um, i get it out. Can't do a lesson like this without getting in a mess. Is have you have you done this with ordinary cola and sugar-free cola? There's lots you can discuss with this, but if you put um, a can of cola in, sometimes it just about floats. Um, this one is, is sinking. If you put the diet coke in, it floats. You see, see that there's Coke and there's the Diet Coke floating. Um, and to cut a long story short, that's because of the sugar in the uh, in the Coke. Um, the sugar makes things thicker, doesn't it? And uh, it's like the blood. Um, and uh, so you can discuss that, but you could also say, well. Do we know that there's the same amount of liquid in the in the two drinks? Um, this says 330 milliliters. Is it 330 milliliters? You may be even to work out the volume of the can 
Um, that would be quite hard, but how do you know that there's the same amount of liquid in both things? You could, how would you verify that? You could open them and do lots of extra things. So I think that's that's done my floating, floating and sinking. Um, the last one is if you have um, some water in your beaker and you put this on a, on a balance, and little ones get this wrong actually. So you put the orange beside the beaker of water and then you float the orange. In the beaker, I haven't got any water in there, but we pretend it's floating. Will will the will the reading be the same? Now a lot of young children will say, "Oh, it'll be less because the uh, oranges weigh less in water, or anything weighs less in less in water." But of course, the orange is still there, and the beaker is still there. Um, you might say, as a follow up to that, well, what happens if you stand on your on the scale, on the scales, and you've got your dog beside you, or your whatever you carry, your doll or your skateboard, and you have the two separate. If you lift one up, will the scale reading change? And of course, that makes more sense that they don't. So this is the same. The water supporting the orange just as much as you might be. So that's a nice little one. There you go. The reading is unchanged. Go through that. So that's my floating scenario. Um, I've just done this. It's not been on uh, the Facebook pages. Yes, this one has last week, but the next one hasn't. So I got a whole load of uh, different things. This, I think, is really good for observation. The first on the right, there's... Um, Ice, pure ice in the uh, in the measuring cylinder. Um, it's coloured with Ribena, uh, black currant juice. Then you have the next one with ice floating on water, and then the next one has ice floating as well, but it's a cylinder. The next one I weighted down the coin with the ice with some coins. So I put the coins in the ice maker and, and froze everything together. Um, and when you Put that in water, it sinks. And the last one is pure water ice floating on salty water. And ask how does, what will happen when everything melts? Um, so the, <clears throat> what does happen is that the melted ice has reduced volume. So you can see that, I think, quite clearly there. The ice that's floating in water, there's no change in the volume, um, the ice is less dense than water. So it melts, it goes into the space of the ice that was in the water. The little sources are on the top, so I wasn't losing anything by evaporation because I had to leave them overnight for everything to melt. Um, the sunk ice, the volume reduces, you can think about that, and the melted ice, it was very slightly volume reduced. Now, you could follow this up, and I'm about to do this with uh, Denise Popple, and she's a lovely lady um, <clears throat> who has done a lot of work with primary schools and storytelling. And what we're doing is we're going to look at some ice in this is a this is the actual tray it's a paint tray do you know how they have like a beach here beach here and then you can put your water in this part now it's two i'm going to tonight i'm going to record this and take lots of pictures and see what happens but if you see on the on the left there's ice, a big iceberg floating in the water. And that is going to melt. We're going to talk about a blood. And then on the other side, on the right, there's ice on land. Um, and that is going to melt as well. And the water is right up to the level 
of the little man, of the little couple here who are having a picnic somewhere, and what's going to happen there. So in one case, the water level rises, and in one case, the water level stays the same. Um, I think you can have quite a good little lesson on the Arctic and, and the Antarctic discussing it. You know, you've got polar bears in the Arctic and penguins in the Antarctic. The Arctic is basically a frozen ocean surrounded by land, and the Antarctic is like an island with ice on the top um, and ice around floating as well. So um, there's lots of different things. I would, I think I would stop there. There's all sorts of other factors in terms of sea levels rising and so on. But um, it's an interesting way to sort of go to the next stage. So that's, uh, I thought of that in bed about three nights ago, and I thought, I thought that was a brilliant one to do. What about this next one? Um, press away, so it's coming. Um, the wooden spoon experiment. Uh, we balance the spoon, and then we break it where the balance is. And we have two halves now, and we say which half is the heaviest. And we can talk about that. Even with uh, intelligent people like yourself, uh, teachers of all levels, secondary and primary, 50% of an audience will say straight away, well, they're the same because it's balanced. But of course, they're not the same because the head is nearest the pivot, nearest the middle, than the long arm. It's a bit like, we don't need to worry about the diagram, but it's a bit like <clears throat> the centre of balance there with mum on one side and the child on the other to balance one's nearer that way, that way around. One's nearer. So you can get into, I mean, I know we have nice seesaw experiments and so on, <laughs> with weight, but there's an application to have you sort of got the idea, but lovely discussion you could have there. Um, the long slinky spring, for those a little bit older, have a spring here, get it in the picture. If I extend it right up to the ceiling, and then I say, I'm going to leave go, and what will happen to the little man? at the point that I leave go. And if you have a, a long enough slinky, um, can't get it all on the screen, but if you have a long enough slinky, the moment you leave go, the forces are still balanced. Now we're into balanced forces. So the force up from the spring on the little man is the same as the force downwards, the force of the earth on the little man. Always, I always use with, well, with everybody now, to talk about the force of the, and the force of the earth on the man, rather than saying you've got up and gravity down. I think a force of something on something is a useful way. So you go, the spring is still up here, and the earth is still down there. So the man stays stationary for a little bit, and then when the spring's contracted, he falls. And you can, you can see that quite well, especially with a, a metal spring that's, that's very long. And the interesting thing about it, the man stays stationary for a moment, um, just sort of as in passing, with older children, I might use ABC, but with younger children, we'll just discuss what happens? When you drop, here's dropping down a stairwell. When you drop the man, once you get it left go, you're in a state of weightlessness for the man, so for the spring, rather, for the spring. So the spring comes together and falls as one compact spring. Next one. I, I will often, if I do a, a, show, a little session with children, I'll often send, start with this. What happens when one beaker is 
poured into another. Here we are, it's my Rabina, too, because they look fully be quite happy if you've got a cocktail like that. And we'll, how, how much will we'll spill? I put a, a plate underneath. Or with little ones, I would just say, will it fill or will it spill? And you get, you know, some people will think, oh, yes, it'll never, oops, never fill. I spilled a little bit, which spoils the experiment. But will it fill or will it spill? For a bit of fun, if somebody says, oh, it'll fill, won't spill, I get them to sit at the front and uh, hold the dish. And then I just, at the last moment, move the dish and put it above the head. And we go, and you can see it perfectly fills. If you want to demonstrate this, what I suggest is you don't measure and work out. You can work out how high it is, 0.81 of the height. You don't measure it. You just fill one and pour half into the other. So that's a sort of measurement and sort of estimation of volume, which is, I think it's quite a difficult thing, in fact. Um, the interesting thing to do with that is that if you've got a cough and you need to take the cough medicine, make sure the spoon is full because those two spoons on the left are only half full and you can pour them into the other one. Right? So next, um, <clears throat> the two balloon experiment is one of my, my favourites for getting people talking. Have two balloons here connected with a, a hose pipe connector, and you can just use a tube and um, bag clips, you know, the, the things. So we'll just, I'll just do that, blow this up a little bit more, and this is quite a good one because you can explain it at different, different, different levels, right. Identical balloon, it's just a different colour. Um, and what happens when I open the gap between them? Will the big one blow the little one up or the little one blow the big one up? And people, a lot of people think big is best. Well, you know, that's not true. It's what's inside that counts. You can do a school assembly about this, you know, about quality inside a person rather than, than outside. So anyway, it's the little one that blows the big one up. So if I did it, it would happen. And then somebody said, oh, well, if you do it that way, will it be different? Or if you do it that way, will it be different? So I'll make it hard for the little one to blow the big one up and open the tap, the little one's blowing the big one up. The reason that younger children understand that is um, when you blow a balloon up, the hardest time is to blow at the beginning. You know, Mummy, will you help me blow this balloon? Will you help me start it? Um, and then all the children, seniors, will get a graph. Um, there's a small balloon blowing the big one, and there's one of my grandchildren on the left. You've got the two together, and then the yellow balloon has blown the blue one up. Um, here's another grandchild. Child. Um, Children react peculiarly to balloons. If you do a balloon with a, a group of four or five year olds, some of them will be scared because it's going to burst. Um, but here we try and blow two balloons up at the same time. And it's because of pressure differences. You can't blow two balloons up at the same time. One always goes first. No matter how hard I blow until this gets right to the end, this one won't start. What else have we got? Oh, here we are. We're talking about pressure. You'll, you'll like this. I've got, um, I bought a vacuum pump to save coffee. And uh, what happens is you can, you can evacuate this by pumping. You, you pump and you pump away. And the question here I ask is, what's happening if you put some marshmallows in and take the air out of here? I can, I can do it um, for you. Um, so what happens? Will the marshmallows get bigger or get smaller? 
And uh, in fact, they get bigger. They get bigger because they're full of little air pockets. And it's a bit like um, having disappeared a balloon inside, which I show you can have pictures of this. And if I look at that balloon, see how big it is? If I pump away, see the balloon is, is bigger and then set the air back and it goes down. So that's what happens to the uh, that's what happens to the marshmallows, the little air bubbles uh, expand inside because the air cut it. Much, much more fun is to build a marshmallow man, right? Just with the, uh, put him in or her into the box and pump away. Now I guarantee but if you, if you can do this, get the lid on and pump away, he will expand. Let's see if I can do it. So I think he's got a little bit bigger. Now, when you do this, I guarantee, and it's not a sexist thing, this. When you let the air back and he goes down, all the girls will say, ah. Oh. So there you go. There he is, a little man. Put him in and he can grow very big. And you let the air back in and the pressure comes back again and, and squashes him. How are we doing for time? Half past, half past four here, yeah, half past five. So we've got plenty, plenty of time. Do, do you like the clock? It's, uh, it's a backwards clock. It's, go, it's going in reverse, which is a bit of fun. I thought I'd do this one with you. Uh, again, a lot of discussion you can have, and really it doesn't matter whether the answers people give are right and wrong, if they've got a good a good reason. So I've got a board here with two blocks and just a piece of hard board that's bent up. And I take my corner and I'm going to roll it backwards and forwards. And when I cut, they love counting how many times it goes backwards and forwards. We, you can do this. Nobody's going to hear you, so you can count out in your own language and we'll see how many times it goes backwards and forwards. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, sixteen, seventeen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three. 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 41. So then I say, right, shake it. They all know what happens when you shake a, a bottle. Will it do more or less? You get all sorts of answers. They say, oh, well, it's, it's, some people will say it, it's heavier now because there's lots of bubbles inside. So how could it possibly be heavier? Um, some will say, oh, the pressure is really high inside now. They so know the word pressure um, because of all the bubbles. So what happens is we'll do it again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. So it's gone much more, much fewer backwards and forwards. And uh, I got this wrong the first time. I thought it was definitely the pressure, but the pressure doesn't actually increase. It's because of the bubbles floating behind and you get a drag because of the bubbles. If you do it with a bottle, you can see the bubbles actually 
like almost like an air resistance thing, a drag behind. But um, I'm not sure how much science is in that, but it's, uh, it's, it's good for... And the other interesting thing, I don't know if you know, if you've got a, bubble, a, a cam that's been shaken and you want to get rid of the bubbles, that will get rid of the bubbles. And we'll not perhaps get back to 40 again, but two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty. It's obviously going to go much more than the twenty that we got with all the bubbles. I'll just stop that. And move on because I'm trying to do as many little exciting things as I can. This is so good for science, um, and it's very good for some children who normally don't get things right or can't do things because this is one of the easiest experiments to perform, and yet it looks more spectacular. I'm going to have to move at this point, put that on the floor. Oops. And I've got three beakers, one, two, three. I've got a fourth one for a reason. I've got a, a placemat, and the placemat is slippy on that side and a little bit rough on this side. Put that there. And I've got three Smarty tubes, no smarties. One and uh, didn't know where I get this for, so I've just got to empty the smarties. Empty the smarties. That makes the tubes very light, quite heavy with the smarties in it. Oops, the ends come off. Oh, look at that. All those smarties. And I can't share them with you. What a pity. Ha, ha. And then balance the tubes. Let's put that one up. Down. And I've got some juggling balls. But you can't use eggs. There's eggs in the video that's in the what happens next. I'm not, not sure. A juggling bag on that one. And the idea is I'm gonna knock the I'm gonna knock this out of the way. Right? Bang. Knock it out of the way. And what will happen? And I'm gonna predict that the balls will fall straight down into the beakers. Because slippy on the bottom, so it'll slip off. A little bit of roughness there, so that will move. The smarty tubes. Smarty tubes are quite light, so they'll move easily. When you get up to the ball, if the smarty tube moves out of the way, what forces are acting on the ball? Just gravity, just the force of the earth on the ball. So I can't fail. So come on, Johnny, come and help me. Oh, I can't do it, I can't do it. Um, if you do it with confidence, it works every time. See how confident I am? So I'll just hold these, just so they all... Oh. That's a bit of a pity. Put that back. I don't know what's happened to me. Bottom's not on it. This is live. I've lost the bag. I'll use an apple instead. Right, so I'm going to knock this. When you're doing it with the children, they've got to believe they're going to do it. If you believe you're going to be doing it, you'll get it right. If you dither on, you'll get it wrong. So we hold those and give this as big a bag as there you see the balls 
are in the clay. And there's a lot of clients in that, isn't there? There's sort of the friction and so on. Here we go. Yes, did it that time. Um, I quite like with younger ones, and even with older ones who have different ideas, dropping a tennis ball and a table tennis ball, which will arrive first. From this height, they both arrive at the same time. If you listen very carefully, you'll hear only one bounce, right? Whereas um, a lot, they do a lot on air resistance at times in some schools, and they think the table tennis ball will go slower. Now, it will if you do it from the third story. The air resistance becomes significant. But you can drop all sorts of things, I think, um, and, and show this. I like a piece of wood and a fifth of the piece of wood. Drop them both together from that height, and they land together. You could actually get another piece of wood like this and chop it into five, put the five together as a block, and they drop. And a good one to do, you can't see this, but these two balls look the same and drop them, and they drop together. This one is full of water, so it's really quite, quite heavy compared to the other one. This one weighs, oops, get me, zero, 50 grams. This one weighs 150 grams. So this is three times as heavy. If you, if you don't tell them, then you just drop them and say, why do they land together? They'll say, oh, well, they're the same. What do you mean by the same? And then you can explore that. And there's the other, other two to remind you. Um, talking about, this is from Paul Nugent in, uh, in Ireland. Is anybody from Ireland there? Give me a wave. Um, estimating volume. It's very difficult to estimate or compare a curved distance with a straight distance. So which is bigger, this length here, or around the edge of the glass? Which is biggest? And it looks to me as if this bit is by far the biggest. But I can check it in two ways, in three ways, in fact. I put my fingers around the bottle. They don't quite meet. Oh, it's a glass, not a bottle. How stupid. But look. That my fingers much 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 longer. So that distance there must be bigger. I can test it with a piece of rope or string or something like that. Here we go. That's to there. Put that. Do you see that? That was round. Hold that at the bottom. And look at that, it goes right over the top. Or better still, here's the here's the glass tumbler. Um, I found this in a toy shop. I'm an addict for going into toy shops. You know, my wife likes to go into shoe shops. I like to go into toy shops when I'm on holiday. Three balls. Come over here. One, two, three three diameters. Can you remember at school the, di the circumference of a circle? Pi times diameter, 3.14, you might recall that. I've done that with on the video that does this one. Um, my grandson quotes pi to goodness knows how many um, significant figures, 3.1445, da, 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 da. I can't do that. But uh, some of the children can, and it's uh, encouraging. So that's that one. Oh, we know that. And then the other one that sort of in terms of uh, estimating distance, it's quite interesting how many coins, can you estimate how many coins you need to make a diameter? Well, there's, um, it's 13 there with English 10 Ps, British 10 Ps. So there we are. I hope there's some things in there that are good for you to just discuss because I think that's the key, really the key at primary level to get them interested in discussing and observing carefully. 
even just to do this last one with a set of coins and count how many and so on. Um, there's lots more. As I say, I started doing these videos um, when lockdown began in March, and I've now got 80, 80, I think I've just recorded 84. Um, and I'm keeping going, I'd like to get to 100. So if you've got any ideas, please let me know.